Right, we're looking at a Gutman chart, uh, and this is one that's already been sorted. We've got the student identification down at the left hand side, and we've got the skills embedded in each item across the top. Now, these have already been sorted so that the students at the top here are those who've got most, if not all, of the items correct, and the students at the bottom are the ones who've got the least items correct. The questions over here on the left hand side are those that have got most students with the correct answer, and the ones on the right hand side are those with the, the, the least number of students with the correct answer. Now we can divide this into sections. If we draw a line through here, we can see that for the most part above that line, it, red shaded means that it's mostly correct, and below the line, uh, white means that it's mostly incorrect. And we can see that there's quite a clear diagonal in this. Now there's also, we can see that this, these items over to the right are the more difficult items because fewer students get them correct. And these are the easy items because most students get them correct. So we need to wonder about these questions in here. Why would they uh, be incorrect when they're so easy? And we need also to wonder about these ones over here. Why would they be correct when they're so difficult? This may be guessing and this may be careless. In any case, we don't bother too much about it because uh, they're not really the major source of information that we might get. Now, what we can use the Gutman chart for as well is to get what we'd call zones of proximal development and we need this diagonal to get this idea because if we put a boundary around this, now we can see that we've captured most of the region where the transition from correct to incorrect so as we move across to the right, students' answers go from mostly correct to mostly incorrect. And there's this transition in the middle here. So we can now start grouping questions within this band, quite arbitrarily, but we can see that we can, we can look at sets of questions. So this group of students here, would benefit most from instruction about the skills embedded in these items. So we'd look up here and we can see that there's a set of skills where they might be able to benefit from instruction. This one here would benefit from instruction here. So, and we've got another group, another, another. Each of these represents a zone of proximal development. Now I've also drawn them so that they overlap a little bit. And that's okay, that we don't have zones of proximal development that are discrete for everybody. So let's, let's do this again on a clean sheet. Draw in that kind of boundary where the transition takes place. And we'll focus on just one group of students. Here's a quite large zone here. And this group of students, we can see, goes from, they can do most of these questions, they can do very few of these questions, but in this set of skills here, we have them in what we'd call a transition or the zone of proximal development. And we can read the skills in here and we can think about what's the big idea behind this? What's the overall skill? Not the discrete items, because if we take this set of items away, replace it with another set of items, we get another set of skills. But they'd still be in the same broad zone of proximal development. So this is the big idea that these skills represent. And we can do that for all the kids in the class. If we continue to come back to this zone, and we've got one zone there. We've got a, a group of low achieving students down here. Now we've got a different set of skills. So the zone of proximal development. What's the big idea for these kids? Another zone up here. And this is quite a broad one. But the teacher now might be able to define three or maybe four zones of proximal development and plan instruction 
around the kind of skill sets and, and the underlying construct that might be uh, important for these kids to develop. The important thing to note is that they're not all developing at the same rate. So we've got kids down here who are struggling with the easy questions and we've got kids up here who are struggling with the more difficult questions. We can also see that the test was pretty easy for these kids. In fact, if we were to extend this chart over here, these kids at the top, their zone of proximal development is outside the range of the test. So we'd need to test these kids with a harder test in order to find their zone of proximal development or the kinds of skills that transition. We can also see that these questions down here, these ones, are not much use. They're, they're just too easy. Everybody's getting the right answer. So targeting this test is just a little bit off we needed to move it just a little bit more towards the more difficult end so that we could identify a zone of proximal development for the more able kids and we could just assume that most of the kids, if not all of them, could do the easy questions on the test. So the Gutman chart actually is a fairly rich source of information for teachers and if we can get that kind of information, not just from the ARCOTS tests, but if you can do this with NAPLAN, you can do it with Pat A, you can do it with uh, the torch test, you can do it with any kind of test that you do and in fact uh, sometimes we're able to do it with even rating scales and partial credits and we can do the same sort of thing with those. But we won't go into that, that's too complex given that this gives people a bit of a struggle, we won't go into the more difficult and the more complex ones.